Romans 6. Also, just want to let you know, um, a number of us went down to uh, a church today called Life Connection Church, and just, we were invited by the pastor who's a friend of mine to come down there, and we did like a little conversation, him and I on the stage about Philippians 1, and uh, just a chance for us to partner together in, in saying that the most important thing that we're about is Jesus Christ, and nothing else, no other secondary matters are worth dividing over. And uh, this is a great guy that I've met. His name's Aaron. And um, anyhow, it was, a, it was a great time. There's a few of us that went. The Doherty's went. Uh, the Atax went. Um, at the end of the meeting, we were walking out, and I hear, I just want, I'm just telling you guys this because it was a cool story. And they're tweaking the levels. And so I'm kind of like taking a long intro here. Um, but this is cool anyway. So, so we left the meeting, and then all of a sudden I hear over the, like the top of the crowd of people talking, hey, we got another one. And I look over and, and over, and there's this, there's this guy, he's 57 years old, and uh, he prayed to receive Christ uh, today at their, at their meeting. And nice. he said, the guy asked him, how old, how old are you? And he said, I'm 57 years old. And he said, he's 57, it's never too late. And the whole place started cheering, and I was so pumped. I was like, yeah, that's what God does. God brings us into his family. And I think, as I was thinking about tonight and this message we're going to teach on, um, the most exciting thing about Grace Church, the most important thing about Grace Church is Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about what we're building, even though we are trying to build uh, a church. But the most important thing is, is Jesus Christ. And we get the joy of looking at his word. We get the joy of looking at who Jesus is, what Jesus did. We get to, to do it together, which is awesome. We don't have to do this alone. We can do it together as a body of believers. And so let's pray. We're going to be in the, uh, our fourth message on this series. We're laying a foundation for the church. Tonight we're going to look at one angle of holiness. It's not going to be like the other message. It's not going to be exhaustive and exhaustive treatment on the topic of holiness, but we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to help us, um, in essence, become more holy because of his word tonight. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for allowing us the privilege to gather together and to study your word which we've already seen is been God-breathed. It's been breathed out by you. Every word is given to us by you, from you to accomplish your purpose. And as we study it tonight, Lord, we pray that you would help us. And Lord, I, we know ahead of time already what this chapter is about. And so we know, Lord, it's about holiness and how to walk in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. So help us, Lord. I pray that because of tonight, we would be, we'd be motivated. We'd be energized. We'd have more love for you. And it would lead us to want to forsake sin and to be holy as Jesus Christ is holy. We thank you for Jesus because apart from him and apart from what he did for us on the cross, we could not attempt to be holy. But he did die for us. We're going to study that tonight. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done in our lives. Lord, thank you for the guests that are visiting with us tonight. <clears throat> Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 6, we're going to be in uh, verses 1 through 14. Well, I've been reading a number of books for the last few months, I've been working on this one book. It's called The Team of Rivals. The Team of Rivals is a book written on the, on the uh, life of Abraham Lincoln. And it is an amazing book. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. I've been going through it off and on. And uh, it's really interesting studying Lincoln if you've, ne if you've never studied before. There's a lot of things that are coming to the surface through this book that I never knew about Abraham Lincoln. And the first is he, he never really was attempting to, uh, to eradicate slavery. That wasn't his main goal. When he became the president, his main goal was to attempt to keep the union together. That was, his, that was his top desire. He had a personal conviction against slavery, but he, he wasn't becoming the president to try to eradicate slavery. He was trying to keep the union together. And there was one point in his presidency early on where he realized that's not possible. It's not possible to not make slavery the main issue. And so as you know from our, from our history books, he issued uh, on, April, on January 1st, 1863, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. He freed all slaves. He declared all slaves in the northern states and in the southern states to be freed, which is quite a move because he really didn't have the political power to free the slaves of the, of the southern states that he was at war with. But he made this proclamation, he made this declaration that slavery was abolished and that slaves should be released and then finally, after the 13th Amendment was passed, the abolition of slavery became a reality, and slave owners started releasing their slaves. A surprising thing happened. Not in every case, but in some cases, slaves did not want to be released. 
It's not because they didn't want freedom. They wanted freedom. It's because they didn't know what to do with the freedom that they had gained. You have to imagine a slave growing up in a home, in, in, in the owner's home, not having any friends outside of the other slaves, not having an education, not having a network, not really having any place to go and land on their feet. So when the news of slavery comes, where would you go? You're freed. Where do you go? Many of the slaves, a number of the slaves, as reports you can read, would say that they didn't have any place to go and that some of them, although they, they knew that slavery was and, and, and living with their owner was wrong or was not the best, it wasn't the best for them, it was familiar. And so they stayed, maybe not under the same conditions that they had previously been, been living in, but they stayed. Not the best, but it's familiar. And I think that's true for us too in the Christian life when we consider the topic of sin and the topic of holiness. We know, as we've seen from God's word through the preaching in the last few weeks, that we have been irre irre uh, irrevocably set free, permanently set free from the power and penalty of sin through Jesus Christ. Because of what Christ did, we are no longer slaves. We have been set free. All punishment for our sins, past, present, and future, have been placed upon Christ. All to the glory of God. We've been set free, and that's great news. We said that's the greatest news that there is. The greatest news that's ever been newsworthy is that we have been set free from the guilt and the penalty of our sin. But that's only great news if we walk in that freedom. It's only great news if we, if we take hold of that freedom. It's only great news if we actually live as men and women who are freed. If we walk out of the courtroom and we pick back up our shackles of sin, we place it back on our wrists and back on our ankles, we're going to be slaves once again from the very things that Christ has died to set us free from. And we all know what this is like. Because we all walk in, in many different ways in sin. We all have sin that still, that still takes us down. I became a Christian later on in life, and if you became a Christian as an adult, this may have been your experience as well too, but becoming a Christian later in life, there's a little bit of a, a honeymoon period. As you become a believer, you understand the truths about what Christ did, and you watch as your life changes right before your eyes in some massive ways. I, and I've heard reports of people who had they had drug addictions, totally gone, coming to Christ. Homosexuality, totally repented of, coming to Christ. And there's this honeymoon period where you feel like you've got complete victory in, in the Christian life. You, you start to think, how in the world could I ever go back to those sins? And then you hit this time, this period, and we all have walked in it where sins you think you've had beaten, sins you think are way behind you, sins you think you're way beyond pop back up, they surface themselves, and you're reminded that sin is a very present neighbor in your life. You don't even have to, where did that come from is what your question is. We have sins of anger, we have sins of pride, sins of lust, sins of unbelief, sins of fear, sins of doubt, doubting who God is. See, it doesn't take long to be a Christian to forget that it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Galatians says that very truth. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. But we live so often with the shackles around our wrists with our old sin that we can forget that it was for freedom that Christ died. See, it's one thing to be freed theologically. It's another thing to be freed practically and walking it out in your daily life. Putting off sin, putting on righteousness. It's not the best, but at least it's familiar. That's how our sin can feel. Well, we're going to see from Romans 6, 1 through 14, Paul is going to help us not sin. Paul is going to help us walk in freedom. We're going to see the foundation for fighting sin, and we're going to see the motivation for fighting sin, and then we're going to see the application of what do we do to walk in holiness through Romans 6, 1 through 14. So let's open God's word, and let's read it together. Can we stand want to distinguish between God's words being read and my words being preached. This is God's word. Chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Let's pray and ask God to illuminate this word to us. Lord, we pray for your spirit, which we saw last week, illuminates us to the truth of Jesus. And Lord, there is some great truth about Jesus in this passage that we must believe, that we pray you help us to believe. More than, more than that, Lord, on the basis of that belief, we pray you'd help us to walk in it so that we might not walk in sin, but walk in holiness. And we know that your spirit that does it in us, Lord, we rest not on ourselves in any way, but rest wholly on you with anticipation, knowing you are good. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you can find your seat. The first five chapters of the book of Romans are about justification by faith. The first five books are about how to get right with God, how God makes us right with him through Jesus Christ. And if we were to have been studying this book all the way through, what we would have learned is that we have been united with Adam, Adam, the first man to live. We've been joined together with Adam. He's acted as our representative. And Adam has failed. And in his failure, through his sin, he has enslaved every person who has ever lived. We're joined with Adam. We're together with Adam. Romans 1 through 5 says, we've become enslaved because of Adam. Because of him, all sin. Because of Adam, all die. Adam the enslaver, we're in him. But then we see in Romans 5 that Christ has come and he has come as the second Adam. He's come as the, uh, another to represent us. And this time he has perfectly obeyed. And where, where Adam failed and had enslaved the world, Christ comes and he has lived perfectly and he has redeemed the world by faith. And so we're transferred by faith out of Adam, the enslaver, and into Christ, the redeemer. We're counted righteous. God sees us as righteous even though we're guilty. He justifies us. We're forgiven. That's what, that's what these words mean. We're, we're standing right before God. Despite our very real guilt, God, the righteous judge, looks at Christ and his righteousness and pardons us in our sin. And then we come to Romans 6, and the question that's being asked in this passage is, if Christ's penalty, if Christ's pardon for our sin, if Christ's death, if his justifying work brings God glory, if our sin being pardoned brings God glory, then wouldn't it make sense that if we really are, are set on giving God glory, that we would sin all the more? If we really want glory, God gets glory from pardoning our sin, then we should sin. That's the question that's being asked. And Paul starts this chapter off with a resounding no. He says, may it never be. The language there is as strong as it can possibly be. Don't even have this way of thinking in your mind. It, it's ludicrous. There's no, there's no way for a Christian to even th begin to start thinking along these lines. You can't think, hey, sweet, I'm forgiven. All my sins past, all my sins present, all my sins future have been forgiven. So great, I can go and sin all I want. No, may it never be. That's wrong. That's what Paul is starting to address here in chapter 6. It's clear from verse 2 that we are to fight sin. This kind of thinking cannot be our thinking as Christians. We're called to fight sin. It says, how can we who died to sin 
still live in it? We can't. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We can't. It's a rhetorical question. He, he's, he's leading us on to the answer, we can't. We shouldn't. We ought not to live in sin because we have died to sin in Christ. But instead of answering that question immediately, he does kind of answer it later on. He says, let sin not reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. He gets there later on. He doesn't get there right away. He wants to explain, he wants to connect how it is that we are to live in a way in which we are forsaking this sin and walking in righteousness. There's a connection between our faith in Christ that justifies us, the faith that we have when we come to Christ that makes us right. There's a connection between that faith and the walking out of our holiness. If you say you have faith and you say you're in Christ, you say you've left Adam the enslaver, you're now joined, united with Christ, there's a connection between that faith and the way that you live your life. And he's going to show us what that connection is. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So we have to get in our minds as we start that all Christians, all Christians, no, no Christians who have been freed from the guilt of their sins should continue on in a lifestyle of ongoing, unrepentant sin. May it never be. But there is a foundation that that truth sits on and there's motivation to help us and we're going to see what that is. And the first point, which is the foundation, is that Christ's death, Christ's death is our death. This reality, this truth that defines our lives, Christ's death is our death. The foundation for fighting sin is not our willpower. It's not self-generated. The foundation for fighting sin is to understand how our union with Christ breaks the power of sin. Christ's death becomes our death. And so we have to ask the question, where do we look? Where do we look to understand this? Well, we need to look back. We need to look back upon what Christ did. So five chapters of the book of Romans about who Christ is and what he did. Then this question, how should we live? And Paul's going to give no new secret, no new tip. He's not going to give the latest craze. He's going to say, look back. Look back upon Christ and understand what he did for you in his death. Because his death is our death. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized with Christ were baptized into his death? Notice the language of all these metaphors of us being joined together with Christ, baptized into his death. Verse 4, we were buried with him by baptism into death. Verse 5, we're united with him in a death like his. Also, it says united in a resurrection like his. Verse 6, the old self has been crucified. Verse 7, Christ has died now. If, you've been, if you're in Christ, you have been set free. All of these are metaphors to show that what happened to Christ happened to us. Christ's death and our connection to him because we are in him. The Bible says we are in Christ and this is what it means. It means that what Christ did happened to us. What Christ did physically happened to us. It's one of the most mysterious, it's one of the most unbelievable truths of the Bible but it is reality and we have to believe it to be reality otherwise we have no foundation for fighting sin. Christ died for us and we are somehow mysteriously yet truly connected with Christ so that when he died physically, we died to sin. We're in him. His death has become our death. This is not just theology for theology's sake. I know this is a little bit abstract, but, but this isn't just theology for theology's sake. Paul's not writing this because he just likes to read his own letters and think, wow, that was really deep. I just wrote Romans 6. That was amazing. He's writing this for a purpose. He wants us to understand because he knows that apart from understanding this truth, we cannot fight sin. Fighting sin is not about just having a positive outlook on life. It's not about just, just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and just saying, I'm never going to do that again. No, it's about remembering. It's about remembering the foundation. You all know, just because I know that you're sinful just like me, that if you try to do that, you see how long that lasts. It doesn't last very long. We, we, we are... We are diseased by sin. Sin ravages our body. And so what had to happen, happened. We had to become united with Christ in his death so that though we've not yet physically died, when Christ died, we died with him in regards to sin. And when Christ was raised from the dead, we too have become raised from the dead in regards to sin. Now it says we have the newness of life to walk in. Verse 6 says that our old self was crucified with Christ. Not physically, 
But our old self, our sinful nature, has been crucified with Christ in order that we might become free from sin. This is the foundation. And it can be so easy when it comes to fighting sin for us to start with us, isn't it? It's so easy to start with what I'm going to do. You, you know your sin. It's clear in your mind. You see it. You know you want to change. And we can so quickly and so immediately go to, what do I need to do? What's the plan? And we, we say things like this to ourselves. If you want to stop being bitter, just, just stop thinking about it so much. If you want to be more diligent, just set your alarm clock and get up earlier. You have slogans like, just say no. I mean, there's some reality to it, as we're going to see later on, but it's not the foundation. God never begins with us when it comes to our change. He always starts with Christ. We always have to look back upon what Christ has done for us. And we have to remember that Christ was the one who initiated this work in us. It doesn't hinge on us. It doesn't depend on us, and that's good news because when we fail, we know that Christ is still working in us. All of this, a historic fact that stands outside of you, that occurred before you were ever born, the reality that when Christ died, those who have faith in him have been united and have died to sin. That is the foundation. We must look back. So how does this truth function for us? Well, it functions, as I'm sure you can guess, that the first place we start when it comes to fighting sin is not us. We don't start fighting sin by looking at us. We don't start by trying to set forth a plan. We don't start with our actions. We don't start with our feelings. We don't start with any of these things. We start with the reality of God and his word. We believe first that Jesus Christ has died for us. That's the place we start when we think about fighting sin. We remember. We remember what Christ has done. Please do not attempt to fight sin. They should put a label. Please do not attempt to fight sin without remembering Jesus Christ and his power to break your sin through his death. So before you do anything, before you go to your community group, before you go to AA, before you do whatever you do to fight sin, look back upon Christ and remember that you're no longer a slave. Once you were a slave, no longer. Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, you're no longer a slave, no matter what you feel like. And let me tell you, there will be times when you don't feel like the power of sin is broken in your life. There are lots of times. I've had those times today where I have thought, surely the power of sin in this area, my impatience with my kids, surely I'm preaching a message today on the power of sin being broken. How could I not, how could I be impatient with my kids? But you know what? It's right there. It's right there. Maybe your sin is something different. Maybe you find yourself standing in front of the refrigerator door at 9 o'clock at night. You're not hungry at all, but you're just looking for something. You're just looking for some satisfaction in what you can eat. That's the sin of mine as well, too. Whatever your sin is, whatever plagues you. I just got on the list of all my sins. <laughs> That'll encourage you all today. You're going to be like, I thought you are preaching on the power of being broken. <laughs> yes, I am. And that's why, if nothing else, I'm exhorting myself through this message to not sin. We have to remember that when God says, this is, very, this is very timely to mention this, he says that we're freed from sin. He's not saying we've become sin-free. That's not what it means to be freed from sin. It, it's that we're freed from the reality that we no longer have to sin. We no longer have to sin. We no longer have to get impatient with our kids. We no longer have to stand in front of the refrigerator door trying to find something to eat when you're not hungry. We no longer have to do these sins because we're in Christ. We're no longer obligated because Jesus has died for us and now the Holy Spirit lives in us and indwells us and motivates us to live for him and it's possible to not sin. And so that should bring us hope because none of us are sin-free. But it should bring us hope that for a group of people who are not sin-free, it's possible to not sin no matter what the circumstances look like, no matter what the most challenging thing you're facing right now, you can, in fact, resist sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what God's Word says. Despite your feelings, despite your experiences, the power has been put to death. That's the foundation that we look back on. But there's more. There's motivation for fighting sin as well. And that's this. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. His death is our death, His resurrection is our resurrection as well. We look backwards for the foundation, but we look forward to his resurrection. And his resurrection serves to motivate us to pursue holiness. We see in verse 5, if we've been united with him in a death like his, 
we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Look at what he's saying. Look more closely. If we've been united with him in his death, past tense, we already have been, we've already established that we have been, then we shall be united with him. We shall. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his future tense. And then in verse 8, it says, Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we also will live with him. There's this rock-solid promise that because Christ died and we were with him in his death, that when Christ was raised from the dead, we have become raised from the dead with him too, both now and when we die. That's the promise. That's the motivation. Think about this. He says that we are now made alive. We've been, those have been brought from death to life. But, but the promise is still held out for us that we will face a resurrection of our bodies as well too one day. Just as he has been resurrected, we will be united with him. That's the promise. Now think about this. Think about that moment. Think about that breathtaking moment when you stand before the Lord and you've lived your entire life to fight sin. You lived your entire life to please God, to, to walk in holiness. And you fought, and you fought hard, and you failed many times but you've been pardoned. And one day, you're going to stand before the Lord and you're going to be perfectly holy. And the fight is going to be done. And every sin that has plagued you will be gone. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin. That's the promise for everyone who has been united with Christ. And that should bring motivation. I had a class my senior year in high school. had two different classes. They turned out radically different. One class I was doing poorly in, and I hated that class. I was reminded every time I went to that class at how bad I was doing. And there really wasn't any good way for me to get out of it either. I had another class, and I'm not sure why this happened, but the teacher told me and told a number of us in the beginning, basically at the beginning of the class, that we were going to get A's at the end of the year, no matter what, really, being serious. He told us we were going to get A's pretty much no matter what. And he told us that because he said, I just want you to be freed to learn. I just want you to be freed to learn and not to worry about your grade. And you know what's true? Is that that was the class that I worked the hardest in. Of those two, <laughs> I worked way harder for the class I already had the A in than the class in which I knew that I was getting bad grades all the way through. There was something in freeing about knowing what the end was going to be, that I didn't have to worry about it. It, it motivated me, and that, that same principle should motivate us in our spiritual lives. We know the end game. We know the final grade. The final grade is perfection with Christ, and that should motivate us. That should motivate us to look ahead and to live for Christ. We want to be holy. We want to be pure. We want to live for Him. We don't want to live for this world. We don't want to just be moral Christians. It's not enough to just be a moral Christian. We want to be Christians who follow after Christ, who make much of Jesus Christ. We want to look ahead to his resurrection and await the promise of our resurrection. I can't wait until we're resurrected with him. That, that, that blows my mind to think about that day. That day is just as real as this day that we're sitting in now. We're going to be with him. We're going to be like him. And in fact, he's freed us. He's freed us from sin for this very reason. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. He's begun the good work to bring us to that day so that we could be holy and walk in the newness of life forever with him. And so, are you looking ahead today? Are you looking ahead? Are you looking at Christ? Are you bogged down by your life, by your circumstance, by your sin? We need to look at our sin to address our sin, but we need to look ahead at what Christ has done. Is Christ your life? Do you live for Christ? Does the future hope of Christ motivate you? It should. If it doesn't, you're not thinking rightly about Christ. That's why Paul's writing this section, is to motivate us to not sin. There's a day of glory that's going to come, and it's going to be awesome, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to blow our minds from what we can even imagine, and it's real. And we must believe it's real. I spent the majority of my life swimming for a goal that never happened. My, my sole desire was to qualify for nationals. I spent 11 years swimming. I wanted to be an All-American. I wanted to win states in both the events that I swam in. 
and I wanted to qualify for the national team. Now, in swimming, you have to hit a certain time in order to qualify. It's not like ranked by place. So anybody, you know, the whole world could qualify if they were all fast enough. In the events that I swam, there were only two people the year before me in high school that had qualified for it. That was my goal. I wanted to be one of those guys who qualified for nationals. And here's what that did for my life. And there are days when this still shocks me that I actually did this um, because I'm nowhere, <laughs> nowhere near this these days. I'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning. We'd get to swim practice by 5.15. Swim from 5.30 to 7. This is literally almost every morning except for Sundays. Came home, went to school. Would swim again with my high school team from 2 to 3.30 for another hour and a half. Cram in as much homework as I could, eat a quick dinner, go back to swim practice again, 5.30 to 8. And that was almost every night, every day. Five hours a day. I didn't go to parties. I didn't go to events. I didn't go to concerts. I didn't go on trips. Not because I didn't want to, because I wanted to, but because there was something I wanted more. There was something that, that, that gripped me more than, than the pursuit of those things. I wanted to qualify for nationals. And so I gave my life for that. And I failed. I missed All-American by one-tenth two times. Our team placed third overall. We did not win. I placed sixth. I placed eighth in my events. And I never qualified for nationals. I did all of that work and all of that training for a day that never came. But as we look at God's word, we have the promise. We have the assurance. We have the certainty that this future day of glory is coming. And we will be with him if we're united to Christ. And that should bring us confidence to fight sin. It should motivate us to be holy because this day of glory is real. And we will not fail because Christ has not failed. And so let me ask you the question, are you motivated to fight sin? Let's be motivated to fight sin. Let's be motivated to walk in holiness because as we look ahead, we see the future hope of the living and reigning Christ. So we look back upon Christ and his death. Our death is his death. We look ahead to Christ and we see his resurrection will be our resurrection. And now we get to the what are we supposed to do section of the scripture in verse 12. We're to think dead, we're to act alive. We're to think dead, act alive. Let's read in verse 12. After setting the foundation, after setting the motivation, after charging us to consider ourselves dead to sin, he says this in verse 12, Let not sin reign, therefore, in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. That is a command. We have been charged by God to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Verse 13, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. This brings it back full circle. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We can't because Christ has died and we've died with him. Christ has been resurrected. We're resurrected with him. So don't sin. It's not very complicated. Don't sin. That's Paul's charge. Don't sin. Christ has broken the power of sin, so don't sin. I think it's, it's too easy for us to focus, and, and it's good to focus on Christ taking the penalty of our sin, the guilt of our sin, the payment for our sin. But he's also broken the power, and so he can command us, and we can attempt to do this. Don't sin. Don't let yourself off the hook. Don't sin. And I'm really preaching this to me. Don't sin. He casts his exhortation in terms of a battle. Notice the language. He says reigning. Don't let your sin reign over your mortal body. It's this, this idea of a kingdom and of this, of this battle that's taking place for the throne of our hearts. The heart rules our lives. Where the heart goes, we go. And sin is the enemy that's trying to gain control of you. Sin is not an action. Sin is not an act, per se. Sin is the power that affects you to not obey God. It's that desire inside your heart to not obey God. It's the desire to displease God. It's the desire to make your own rule. 
that in this picture, your body is the castle that's under attack by the power of sin. And if conquered by sin's power, gives up parts of the castle. That's the metaphor that Paul's working with. And now that the power of sin has been broken, we have good desires that live inside this castle. But the enemy is deceptive. The enemy sneaks spies into our castle to try to convert our desires. So remember that honeymoon period? The desires are all good. Everything we think and breathe and live for is Jesus. And then the enemy sneaks spies in to our hearts, to our desires, to make us want to disobey God and capture the castle and take hold of the weapons that can be used in this war. And he says here that the weapons, the instruments, that's the other word for, for instruments is weapons. The weapons are our body, our hands, our arms, our mouths, our feet. So sin is trying to reign over our bodies to take possession of our castle. And the charge for us is to stay true to the true king. Stay aligned to the true king. Do not let the spies... I have a picture in my head of my son. He talks in terms of bad hearts and good hearts. And when he sins, he says, Daddy, the bad hearts. I obeyed the bad hearts. And so we're always talking to him, That's, Trevor, don't obey the bad hearts. Obey the good hearts. Well, it's kind of similar to what, what's saying here, is that your heart can go bad or your heart can be good. So do not let sin reign in your heart. The fight is fought in the heart. We need to think dead. We need to consider ourselves dead. We need to consider ourselves dead to sin. But we need to act alive. What this means is that we need to say no to sin and we need to say yes to righteousness. Again, that's very clear too. Do not present the members of your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. Don't present the members of your body, your, your hands, your arms, your, your tongue. Don't use them as instruments for Satan. Don't use them as instruments for the enemy. Rather, present them as instruments for God. Choose to serve Christ. Choose to fulfill His will. That's the contrast. Don't sin. Present yourself to God. What does it mean to present ourselves to God? John Piper has a great way of explaining it. He says that to present ourselves is to prefer. This, you've got to understand this. To present ourselves is to prefer. It's to prefer one thing over another. Listen, if God is to get the glory in our choosing against sin, and I'm going to insert here, it doesn't say this, but I'm going to insert, it can't be because of self-will. It can't be because of a, a rigid discipline that we, that we possess. It can't be anything that can be attributed back to us in our pride. No, if God is to get the glory in our choosing against sin, it must be because we regard God and what he is and what he promises as preferable. We're not just saying no to sin. We're not just saying yes to God. We're saying no to sin by saying yes to God. We're preferring God over sin. That's how we say no to sin, by saying yes to God. He says choosing is finding one thing preferable to another. So you can describe the battle at this point in negative terms. Say no to the Judas desires of sin on the basis of what God has done and who you are in Christ. You are dead to sin and its desires. They do not look preferable. Or you can describe the battle positively. When sin sends in its Judas desires to tempt you, when it sends in those spies to your heart, prefer God, prefer Him, prefer His work, prefer His ways, prefer His promises. See God as preferable to the fleeting pleasures of sin. Because now you are alive to God and he looks preferable. He is preferable. If Satan attacks with deceitful desires, counter them with reliable desires that will not let you down and that lead to everlasting joy. So, the desire for sleep is good. But if it's taken captive by sin, it can be used, it can be turned to be used for the enemy's purposes into sloth, into laziness. The desire for communication is good. If taken captive by sin, it can be used as a weapon of unrighteousness in slander and in gossip. The desire for drink is good. If taken captive by sin, it can be used as a weapon of unrighteousness for drunkenness. The desire for food is good. But if taken captive by sin, 
can be used as a weapon of unrighteousness for gluttony, for bulimia, for anorexia. The desire for sex is good, but if taken captive by sin, can be used as a weapon of unrighteousness for pornography, for lust, fornication, adultery. The desire for friends is good, but if taken captive by sin, can be used as a weapon of unrighteousness in worldly acts to gain the approval of man. Do you see where the fight is? All of these things can be used for good or for evil. And the exhortation to us is if we're thinking dead, we're saying no to these sins. And if we're, think, if we're acting alive, we're saying no to these sins by preferring Christ in every one of these situations. We want to prefer him. We want to desire him. We want to desire his glory. And that helps us to say no. So, because we're in Christ, we must say no. We must say no. We must say no to desires for laziness by preferring the joy of diligence. We can set our hearts on desiring diligence for the glory of God. We must say no to pornography because we desire Christ and his beauty. We must say no to any kind of vice that controls our minds because Christ is better than any fantasy. Christ is better than any escape that we can find. We must say no to using money as a, as a means of self-worth or to, to promote our own identity or to, to find a satisfaction in this world. We would prefer to be rich in Christ by being poor in spirit. We must prefer holiness in our hearts. Listen, if we walk away this afternoon and we've, all we've heard is don't sin, and you need to hear that, but if all we've heard is don't sin, you won't go far. You must prefer Christ. And so the conclusion of this message is, how are you preferring Christ? Are you preferring Christ? Do you think about Christ? I know how easy it is to not think about Christ. I know how easy it is to think about other things of life. You won't be able to fight sin. You won't be able to please God. You won't be able to walk in holiness unless Christ has dominated your mind. Unless Christ has infused your heart with joy. Grace Church, we're about Jesus Christ. We're to love Christ. We're to know Christ. We're to love him. We're to live for him. That's what we're about in this church. How are you doing as a disciple of Christ? How are you individually preferring Christ? Where do you need to prefer Christ over sin? Let the Spirit convict you. Let the Spirit sift you. And respond. Because remember, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. True freedom means preferring Christ. That's our charge today. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that... Lord, first, before I pray for you to help us, I want to pray, Lord, with thanksgiving in my heart because, Lord, I am the chief sinner and, and, and Father, I know that you have sent your son to die for me to take away the penalty of sin. But, Lord, this glorious truth is that I no longer have to sin. And to be truthful, I need to be reminded of this over and over and over again. So, Lord, thank you for allowing me to preach to myself that I do not have to sin. Because, Lord, I love you, and I don't want to sin. And we love you, and we don't want to sin. We do want to change, Lord, so we pray you'd help us to change, that you would convict us, that, Lord, you would remind us that the sins that we're experiencing conviction for, the areas where we've given into the power of, of the enemy, the power of the spies that have taken hold of our hearts, the places where we've failed to prefer you. Lord, we know that those sins have also been paid for by Christ. But Lord, we know you want to work that out of us and your promise is that one day we're going to be resurrected and all of these sins are going to be worked out. And that gives us great confidence, Lord, to ask you to, to work it out now and to help us to walk in holiness. And so I pray for every person here. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who, as I'm preaching, thinks to themselves, I don't think I know Christ that way at all. Lord, I pray you would regenerate their hearts and that you would make them new, as this passage says, and help them to follow you because you are life. And we're grateful, Lord, that we can worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.